We're just letting attendees gather. I guess in the interest of time, perhaps we'll get started. Um, good morning and well, I'm sorry, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Really glad to be here with you. Uh, before we officially jump in, just wanna do a little bit of logistics around Spanish language interpretation. I wanna invite Jose Ramos to give us an orientation, Romero, pardon me, to give us an orientation. Jose? Hello, this webinar has Spanish interpretation available. If you would like to listen in to the English or Spanish interpretation, I invite you to select the language channel. Uh, you won't see it yet. It'll pop up after I'm done talking. Look for a little globe at the bottom of your screen, click that little globe and then select the language, English or Spanish in which you'd like to listen in. If you're on your cell phone, it's similar. Just look for three little dots and I'm gonna repeat these instructions in Spanish. Buenas. Este este seminario virtual tiene interpretación en español disponible. Si se están uniendo a través de una computadora, lo que van a hacer es van a buscar un globo terraco que está al fondo de la pantalla. No lo van a ver ahorita, se va a activar en un momento. Así que busquen ese globo y luego seleccionen el lenguaje en cual les gustaría escuchar y participar. Si se están uniendo a través de un celular, es un proceso similar. Nomás buscan tres puntitos y luego seleccionan el lenguaje que desean. Si tienen cualquier pregunta, me pueden mandar un mensaje. Okay. Helen, feel free to start the interpretation. And Great, thank you, um, Jose, I appreciate that. So uh, welcome again, I'm Carl Baloney, I'm Vice President and Chief Advocacy Officer with AZ United. AZ United is a national nonprofit focused on ending the HIV epidemic in the United States. We, uh, we pursue that mission uh, through policy and advocacy, strategic grant making and capacity building. I'm really pleased to bring to you all a wonderful panel to discuss the current situation around monkeypox um, and to learn from communities about what's needed. Uh, we'll be joined today by Dr. Dimitri Daskalaskis. He's CDC's Director of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. We'll also be joined by Dr. Alexa Oster, Deputy Incident Manager for the CDC Monkeypox Virus uh, Response Team, uh, DeMarc Hickson with Us Helping Us, and Tyler Tamir with San Francisco AIDS Foundation, both esteemed doctors as well. Um, really thankful for this panel joining us. Um, want to also uh, just comment that folks should utilize the comment section, the Q&A section uh, for questions and answers. We're going to open up with a wonderful update from the CDC from Dr. Daskalaskis, um, and then we'll move to a Q&A um, where we can get into the, the meat and potatoes of the discussion. I want to turn it over to Dr. Daskalaskis, and thanks again for joining us. Great. Thank you very much. And I think you all are running the slides. So if we can put the slides up, that would be fantastic. And in fact, there we are. Thank you for doing that so quickly. So uh, thanks again. Um, I wanted to also introduce uh, Alexa Oster, who I don't think can come on video, but is, you said, the deputy incident manager over the monkeypox response at CDC. So um, she's going to be our continuity. So uh, we have a good connection into the response. So thank you, Alexa, for joining. <clears throat> so um, next slide, please. So I want to just start, well, I want to first say that we're going to get through this really quickly because I really want to focus on questions and hearing from you as opposed to us speaking to you or at you. So first, just briefly, monkeypox is caused by a virus. It can spread from animals to people, and it can spread between people when someone has contact with someone who's infected with monkeypox or touches materials that are contaminated with the virus. 
So people with monkeypox can first start off with a flu-like illness. Um, they can have a fever, headache. They can get muscle aches, exhaustion, kind of like COVID. Plus, they also can get enlarged lymph nodes, so swollen glands. So it's a, a, and then afterwards, a characteristic rash can appear, looks like blisters or pimples, and can occur a few days later. So I think you can see in the pictures some examples of monkeypox rashes. Now, it's important to say that in recent cases, in this outbreak, patients have really um, presented a little differently. So they've had localized rashes that often start around the genitals or anus. Sometimes they don't have the flu-like symptoms. And um, there, it, it, however can, the rash can also be in other areas. But it's it's been interesting that we have folks who are seeing, who are having it in genitals and around the anus. Also important to say, it can also happen in the mouth. Um, so monkeypox can spread to anyone, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, through direct contact with monkeypox rash or scabs on a person's skin, contacts with objects, fabrics, and other things and other surfaces that have been used by someone who has active monkeypox, and contact with respiratory secretions, usually during prolonged face-to-face -face contact. And one example that we always bring up is kissing. So monkeypox can be spread from the time the symptoms start until all the sores have healed and there's a fresh layer of skin over the, the uh, previous lesion. Next slide, please. So um, this slide reflects um, the number of cases as of July 25th. I'll update you and say that it's closer to 6,000 cases in the U.S. and well over 20,000 cases um, worldwide. Um, it's important to remember, and as I said before, monkeypox does not differentiate people based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Anyone can get it. It's just a stupid virus. It doesn't know who people are or what they look like or who they have sex with. It just it can infect people. Um, what is important to note, however, is that the social network in this in which this is spreading, the sexual and social network in which this is spreading right now, is gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. So though it is something that can affect others, right now it's important that that community is keenly aware of what's happening and that we provide very clear, good advice on what to do. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, while CDC works to contain the current outbreak um, and learn more about the virus, it's important that we give people the information that they need so that they can make informed choices, especially if they're in spaces or situations where monkeypox virus could be spread, close skin-to-skin -skin contact, contact with objects that have, that have been exposed to someone with monkeypox, as well as um, uh, respiratory secretions through that close face-to-face -face interaction, for example, kissing. So monkeypox can be spread um, through intimate sexual, during intimate sexual contact. So it is transmissible through sex. But we're not calling it an STD at this point. It's oral, anal, and vaginal sex that leads to touching um, that can be the way that monkeypox can transmit. And that touching is also internal. So if there's rashes on the penis or on the mouth that, or in the anus, that can be a mechanism for transmission. Hugging, massaging, kissing, that's all skin-to-skin -skin contact, prolonged face-to-face -face contact like kissing, and also, like I said, touching objects or things like beds, towels, and don't forget fetish gear and sex toys that people may be in contact with. Um, there are, however, things that you can do that can keep yourself healthy during sex and prevent the spread of monkeypox. Next slide, please. So, Knowledge is power. So the first step is to get informed. Um, we're really excited that we have some good harm reduction approaches to reduce stigma and prevent discrimination while giving people very clear advice. You'll see some great examples of folks who've amplified us. One of the ones that I'm the most proud of is my friend Shay, who um, was very kind to share with 2 million people our guidance. So thank you, Shay Kulay. Sorry about the drag race finale. Um, but Long and the short of it is that we have an opportunity to give people really good advice. And um, it, it really is multi-domain, not just one thing, lots of things. So one thing that we're really clear on saying is that having multiple or anonymous sex partners may increase your chances of exposure to monkeypox. So it's a good plan to consider limiting the number of sex partners and that could reduce the possibility of exposure. This is not a forever thing. It is a for now thing in terms of the advice. We're waiting to ramp up vaccine. And as that happens, our advice will change. 
Also, really good idea to avoid places where you can't see what's happening, but you may have close skin to skin contact or potentially uh, sexual contact. So we give uh, the examples of saunas, back rooms, sex clubs, whether private or public sex parties. So that's places where intimate, often anonymous sexual contact can happen. And that could increase the likelihood of spreading monkeypox, just statistically speaking, by the fact that you're encountering a lot of people. Um, so when thinking about what to do, you have to first make sure that you're getting information from trusted sources. So look at CDC, look at your health departments, look at your trusted community-based organizations, many of which I know are on this call. So thank you for being magnifiers of the messaging. Um, and important to remind people that if you have a rash and that counts as feeling sick, do not attend any gatherings and see a healthcare provider. That's really important messaging. Um, it's also important, uh, this sounds like HIV, to talk to your partners about monkeypox. So this is a hot topic. So I think it's really important for folks to talk a little bit about how they're feeling. If they have sores, it's good to have those conversations, sometimes not so conducive in a sex club. So another reason to have the conversations, even if they start online um, and then eventually transition to in-person. And then the last thing that's really important is we have a biomedical intervention. It's important to get vaccinated, but it's also important to be realistic. We know that vaccines are in short supply. Um, so it's important to follow your local health department and other resources out there to see when you qualify and when vaccines are available. In the meantime, we got to really focus on the harm reduction while we're rolling out vaccine. Next slide, please. And so this is a slide with a thousand links. So I'm, we, I, I hope that we can share, I know we can share the slide deck. So please do share the slide deck. I'm not gonna read HTTP anything, take a look yourself, but I do wanna highlight that we, are, we have our guidance for sexually active people, our safer sex guideline, guidance and, and, um, and safer gatherings. It's gonna evolve over time. So keep an eye on it. Um, it is coming up for a revision like imminently. So expect to see some revisions to uh, safer social gatherings and safer sex very soon. Next slide, please. And it looks as if wonderful folks from CDC are putting, or others are putting links in, in the chat. Um, they're better at multitasking than I, so, or than me. So I want to then um, see, ask Carl if it's okay if we flip the script here and really um, get some, in, hear from people and see if there are any questions that come up as well as any ideas. So I want to see, is it okay for me to start with a couple of questions, Carl? Ooh, I can't hear you. Thanks. Absolutely, Dr. Esbestos. We'd love to uh, get started with some Great. questions. From the and Carl, call me Dimitri for, for, for pity's sake. <laughs> Great. So, so I'm going to, I want to ask two questions and put them together because I think it, I, I want to get sort of folks like a, a temperature check. Um, so first, um, do you think that our information around how to prevent monkeypox is reaching the LGBTQ community? So we've gotten through a lot of trusted messengers and other networks, but um, are we making it and are we making it to queer communities of color? If no, what should we do better? Where should we go and do more? Related to that question is, should we explicitly be telling gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men to, continue, con, to consider curtailing certain sexual activities like multiple and anonymous partners while we rank up, ramp up vaccine availability? We're really saying it, but I want to get your opinion about like, am, am I doing it okay? You're a little bit of my, of my proving ground here. And um, how can we do it better? So I'm going to throw those two questions out there and I'll try to look at the chat as well, although it's acrobatic, frankly, um, on my small laptop. So let's see how it goes. So that means we're open for people to speak, whether that means a raise hand or uh, other. Carl, am I running the, am I responding to the hands or someone from, or one of you all like calling on folks? So uh, Drew on our team is gonna call out Great. questions. Yep, questions are and responses. Just as a heads up, we, we will not be raising folks to speak based on raised hands, but if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and Got we'll it. try to get it to the, the panelists. So everybody, mea culpa, that's my fault. I didn't pay attention. Like, please put your 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 questions in the chat and um, or comments in the chat and uh, we will we will address them. Dr. Desclaskis, while we wait for comments in the chat, we had a great question from Michael Luciano. Yano, he asked whether or not contact with Fravic and other objects used by someone with monkeypox um, 
is uh, cited as a mode of transmission? And if so, what are the risk of transmission in this case? Right. So the question is specifically about objects and if objects can transmit. So I'll start by saying in this outbreak, that's not like a mechanism that we're seeing frequently, but it's something to be aware of. Personal effects are the things to be the most concerned about, specifically in someone who has no monkeypox. I am not walking around the world as an example, concerned about touching like a, 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 a like a, 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 you know, some a paper towel dispenser in the bathroom. But um, if I had know someone has monkeypox, I would make sure that I'm not sharing towels, not sharing personal effects. Um, and also um, in sort of sexual activities, things that folks share, like you want to make sure that you you clean them between people. So if there is our sex toys shared, for example, you want to make sure those are clean. It is a mechanism of transmission, but it seems as if close skin to skin contact continues to be the main driver. Thanks for that, Dr. Dimitri. Um, I don't see a direct smart response elevated uh, from your question. So another question that we have up, on the hills of the World Health Organization declared monkeypox a global public health emergency. Um, there are reports that the Biden administration is considering a declaration uh, of the monkeypox epidemic as a public health emergency in the US. What if any specific resources are gonna be open uh, up at the federal level to ramp up access to vaccines, testing, treatment, other support services, and if so, can we expect an influx of funding as well? Sure, I'll start with um, one quick answer, which is I know all the policy uh, conversations are happening about the about those decisions, and there's multiple options that are being discussed and thought about. So I don't have an update on that. Um, what I'll also say is that um, the sort of level of urgency right now is high, even in the absence of, uh, of any sort of declaration of an emergency uh, domestically. So I think that there is a, a lot of work to ramp up um, vaccine access, um, treatment, accessibility, et cetera. And uh, so I'll say that, you know, keep an eye on that space. There's no answer right now, um, but the urgency level is um, already very high. Thank you very much. Let's, I'm gonna look to the Q&A really quickly. I see we have some comments in the chat as well. Thank you for that. Um, I think a question that uh, could go to likely maybe Tyler and DeMarco, what needs are HIV service organizations currently seeing concerning public education and preventative outreach for monkeypox? And what does the federal government need to be doing to ensure that these services are available broadly? I think Tyler, Dr. Uh, Hickson, if you yeah, I could jump on in. Uh, thanks for the question, Carl. And I um, would definitely say first is um, some financial resources because we are having to navigate um, not only just the education portion, but the actual case management and counseling around these services. And so it takes more than just disseminating or sending out a link to our um, listservs. Um, and I think secondly, also within that is being able to be provided with vaccines. I understand that and acknowledge the short demand, but we do get into communities and places and spaces where this information is not reaching, right? And so I think that for, for an organization such as us helping us that is not an FQHC, but has the capacity to provide vaccines as well as um, um, education, but also put it into our overall framework of sexual health, then I think we can reach uh, these communities as uh, you even asked the question, Dr. Um, Dimitri, around um, getting into the queer communities of color and also uh, being able to, to provide harm reduction advice and counseling in terms of how it may impact their sexual health. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's happening here in San Francisco is just the inaccessibility of um, clinic times for people who need to access vaccine, especially communities of color. So there have been several attempts to try and dedicate specific appointment times for BIPOC communities, but those tend to be in the middle of a workday with less than a day's notice for people to be able to schedule there. So I think guidance around accessibility of sites, ensuring that um, vaccine distribution information and educational information is in multiple languages, all lessons we've learned in the past, which don't seem to be um, being applied in this current crisis across the board, would be really helpful. 
And then I think there's also just not a coordinated, um, there's not a coordinated information stream. So depending on, you know, whether you're talking to your local public health or your state public health entity, the information that you're getting around vaccine availability, um, allocation that's going to be available, how those decisions are being made uh, is all very fragmented information. Thank you, Tyler and uh, DeMarc. Dr. Dimitri, I'm wondering if you have any response to that. And uh, otherwise, we do have some responses to your initial questions. Um, no, I, I think uh, my only response is it really helpful from the listening perspective, which is one of the reasons that we're here. So I think um, we're hearing this, but hearing this from this group is exquisitely important. So thank you. Great. So Anissa Davis, uh, who is a health officer at a local health department, uh, in answer to your question, should we tell community to curtail sex activities while we wait on the vaccine? Uh, she says, I don't see how else we can make a dent in this outbreak because there are so few vaccines um, and so many cases in communities. Yeah, I saw another comment about the sort of shaming aspect, and I'll say that we are so... One of the really amazing things about this, which is a direct sort of education from the HIV um, experience is that the intentionality with which language is fashioned to not do that is really important. So I think, for instance, the word curtail activity would never exist in any of our, of our guidance and would be more about consider this, consider that based on what we know from the science. So think, there's a great, I, I don't know why the comment because there's so many good ones, it's already cycled away. But uh, but yeah, that was that's really helpful. Thank you. I think we are sort of it's there's a really the desire to be temporal and say we have a uh, we don't have enough vaccines. So for like this is like uh, what to consider for now, not forever. It's different. I always say like I, I, I always will in the last two weeks um, with this outbreak, it feels like forever. Um, you know, it would take generations of, of like a behavioral change, for instance, to curtail HIV without a biomedical intervention. This one, it moves fast. So it's it's definitely something that's time limited, which is a good thing. So um, thank you for all of the great the great um, observations and feedback on that, and for answering a question in the chat. You guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Another question we have. Uh, unfortunately, the early response to the monkeypox epidemic has been characterized by the same racial health inequities that we've seen in response to HIV and the COVID pandemic. Um, what needs to happen to ensure that Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities have equitable access to monkeypox vaccines, treatment, and preventive services? I think this can kind of go to everyone. Can I add one thing, Alexa? You can all you if you're allowed if you can be unmuted, you're allowed to chime in too since you're so deep in the response. So I just want to make sure that it's not just to me talking from from that perspective. Absolutely. Well, I haven't had much to add to your fantastic answers. To just me making too. sure. Sorry, back to everyone um, in the question about it, about equity. I think equity, I will just say from the CDC perspective, that is at the top of our minds and we're really doing what we can to, to work to make sure that response to this, um, to this outbreak is considering equity as part of every single piece of the response. And I'm really interested in continuing to hear your thoughts about what we can do better. I'm trying to read everything coming into the chat and there's a lot of great stuff there. So thank you all for chiming in. Yeah, I'm gonna think one thing um, in in response, and I think there's some things we can learn from um, the vaccination clinic that we've been able to do is one that we were able to partner with DC Health, so our local health department, to actually host a vaccine clinic to to specifically target black sexual minority men and their sexual partners, right? And so um, we we had a few hiccups and it, and saw the uh, stringent adherence to requirements um, because we also had quite a few people who wanted to come from Prince George's County in Maryland for the vaccine, um, as well as some of our own staff members who work um, on the front lines uh, who, who were not able to um, get the vaccine. But even in that um, vaccine clinic where we were able to reach nearly a um, hundred uh, sexual minority men, it still showed that those who had high um, levels of resources, high health literacy, um, were the first adopters to this vaccine clinic. But we could have seen possibly a difference um, for those who we had to cancel their appointments. And so um, we are working with our local health the, um, local health departments to host more. Um, in fact, we have two lined up for next week and a few more this month. And we're going to be very intentional um, to be able to reach those who are younger and have who don't have the time to sit and refresh their computer. Every 
country five minutes and who were not able to go to clinics before five o'clock. Um, but I definitely don't want us to have a repeat of COVID. And I really want to bring into this space around um, ensuring that we have cultural congruency in the response as well, because I think that this will um, truly help to address the miscommunication, the medical mistrust, and also the vaccine um, um, hesitancy. So I'll say that a different way. So if we want to reach Black folks, let's have Black folks that are doing it. If we want to have Brown um, and Latinx folks to be reached, have Latinx folks and things to do it. Because as I saw in the chat, um, somebody mentioned that we've done a great job in reaching the white LGBTQ community. But if, um, if we're really going to reach into these queer communities of color, then we really should be positioning those um, who are reflective of the community to get into these communities and to support them. Um, however, that may be, whether it's with response teams um, and things. Because one aspect that we have noticed is that um, if we do take what we've learned from the HIV epidemic and do kind of the, the social networking piece, going to um, some things that if we have a young Black gay man who presents with pox or pimples or whatever, then we're able to do kind of that contact tracing and say we need to reach your sexual partner. So kind of like partner services, right? And so being able to um, do those particular things. I think it's really challenging in um, in the response with such little allocation that is coming to some parts of the country to have these conversations where we lift up what equitable response looks like, especially when there's not guidance for local or state public health to produce equity plans or um, their their exact allocation formula that includes an equitable response. For example, you know, if, if a county only receives 100 doses of a vaccine, but their guidance is to only um, vaccinate those who have been exposed or may have been exposed and then are slowly expanding eligibility based on the number of new confirmed cases in their region, that becomes nearly impossible to lift up um, meeting the community where you're at. You can barely work it into your general operations as a clinic. Thank you. Um, I am blessed to live in uh, the neighborhood near us helping us where uh, Dr. Hickson is located and was able to get my first shot. So we have a relevant question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Can you provide clarification regarding one or two vaccines for monkeypox? Um, public health guidance in varying jurisdictions across the country um, or seem to be a bit unclear. Can you can you shed some light on this? I'm happy to start and I'll see if Alexa um, wants to add more or anybody would like to add more. So, um, so I'll start by saying current guidance um, from CDC, FDA and all of the sort of um, regulatory forces is that this is a two dose vaccine. Um, there's a good reason for that, which is that uh, based on the uh, studies that approved the drug, um, which were again, not based in real monkeypox or, or smallpox exposure, but rather other surrogate, other ways of measuring effectiveness of the vaccine. It appears that you need it two weeks after the second dose to have a really high level of, of uh, protection, at least based on those surrogates of protection. Um, now, one dose does something. Problem is, we can't tell you how much it does. Um, the, and let me give you some like, like circumstantial evidence as to that it does something. We use it for post-exposure prophylaxis. So after an exposure, you get the vaccine and there's enough, it generates an immune response that can either prevent infection or in some cases make the infection less severe. So it means that there's an immune response there. I can't give you a number. I can give you a number for what happens after the second dose a little bit longer. It's like kind of on the order of 85% protection is what we think. So, um, so, Jurisdictions that are selecting to do one dose, I won't really comment beyond that. That's their, they are able, they're they're making that decision. And the right messaging is that um, if you are extending time to that second dose between the first and second dose, really take that harm reduction strategy that makes the most sense for you, um, which really means having an awareness of how monkeypox transmits and uh, taking um, taking actions in in sort of that context to prevent acquisition or transmission. Alexa, do you have anything to add there? Thing to add. Right on. I'm I'm officially a monkeypox vaccine expert. Um, I thought I was just an HIV expert, but guess what? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Dimitri, Omar uh, Martinez Gonzalez asks, what is the CDC's recommendation for folks attending large queer gatherings such as market days? Vaccinations seem to be taking place at events, but supplies are very limited. Yeah, so I think this is a great big picture. Like this is a great sort of uh, thought. Like you know, vaccine availability limits some of what can happen. Um, but I, you know, I, I have a long history of thinking that events are a great place to catch people, even though they don't get protection at the event. It's still really good news that there's like an effort to try to vaccinate some, even though there's limited supply. Social gatherings. Uh, our social gatherings document really gives some clear ideas more to come on that as well. So, you know, I think um, we've been working with um, with um, folks that are promoting these events. We have gone deeper and deeper into a list of promoters to make sure that we get the word out. Every They're actually coming to me now and us now to get our information, which is really uh, awesome, which demonstrates, I think, what the community is like. So yay. Um, but the guidance really is, there's like a range of risks, right? So outdoor events. Um, so if you're dancing at an outdoor event that has space and you have a shirt on, chances of acquiring Hiring, uh, monkey pox is lower than if you're in a tight enclosed space with no shirt on. With that said, the most common mechanism of transmission that we know so far of this is close skin to skin contact that is often associated with sexual encounters. But anyone who's been to a circuit party knows that you can have some close skin to skin contact um, even when you're on the dance floor. So it's just important for folks to understand the, the, the sort of risk and mitigate based on what they're willing to do. Hopefully that answered your question. And Huge thanks, huge thanks to the uh, party folks, the promoters, and, and the jurisdictions who've helped us connect to them, who have been able to magnify the message. And thank you to you all. Um, please do use that Safer Sex and, and Gatherings uh, document that we have, the website. It's really helpful to communicate risk. Great. Tyler and uh, DeMarc, do you have any things that you want to elevate related to needs and communities? So we talked about these community vaccination events and whatnot, but as service providers, are there things that we should know that are challenges you're facing that we'd like to elevate? Yeah, um, I have a bit of a perhaps difficult question or maybe one you can't answer, but um, you know, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of questions and concerns daily on our monkeypox hotline here in San Francisco, which we started um, after an overwhelming response from the community with questions and fear about monkeypox, now getting like over 500 phone calls a day. And uh, there is a common set of questions trying to understand, you know, why are we in this moment where there is not enough vaccine? And then with news that there is vaccine um, sitting in a warehouse in, in Denmark, um, there are a lot of questions around that. So I guess on my mind are, um, you know, if you can answer, is the vaccine sitting in a warehouse in Denmark and it's waiting to be operationalized? Is it here in the US, but we need to figure out how to get it from dose to vaccine and distribution? What kind of financial allocation does that require? I recognize, and I think many of us who are policy savvy recognize that um, we know that it takes time to appropriate dollars and that that is far away. So there might need to be some kind of emergency allocation in order to do that, um, maybe not. But you know, could you talk a little bit about process and timeline and um, how we might actually get this vaccine that we know exists out into the community? So I'll start by saying that, that you know, the, there's a lot of work happening to sort of move vaccine. And what's important to start with is that it's not all ready to move. So there may be the raw materials maybe living in Denmark, but it's not ready to sort of ship because it needs to sort of go through some process um, to actually get into the bottle for shipping. So it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that there's like ready vaccine that's sort of living and ready to go. Um, and so what's, what's important is that there's like an ongoing effort and process on the US government side to make sure that we are accelerating what goes from like raw material to like shippable vaccine. And so that is a huge effort that's happening now. It's pretty exciting, um, but it is one that is, um, that is complex. So um, I think what, what we, and Alexa, you have to correct me, about 800,000 doses shipped. We're actually over a million at this point that have been allocated to jurisdictions. Great. Yeah, it's like 800 just shipped and there was like 300 and something from before. So it's, it's, it's uh, like almost getting a 1.1 million, I bet, right? 
Almost. Let's call it over a million. <laughs> I know it's over a million. I don't know. I don't know beyond that. My, my math was like it's it's over a million work. So so I think Tyler, that maybe that's like probably the the sort of uh, really deeply insightful answer that I have right now, which is that that if there were shippable vaccine, I think it would be shipped. Um, and so I think we're working on 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 sort of what levers we can switch to make sure that we can move things quickly. And I think you've you've heard that there's this new allocation that's coming. And I've got to say it's super dynamic. So one day there's not very much, the next day there may be more. And it's just a question of like it it, it actually represents the the sort of push that you're that is happening on USG side to move it faster. So the fact that it's dynamic, I would take as a sign of goodness, not badness. That's great. Thank you for that update. And um, I guess I would just echo that um, my earlier comment that I would imagine that getting something from a raw material to a usable vaccination would require some investment um, or uh, resources behind it to both convert from raw material to dose and to get out into the community. Not sure where those dollars will end up coming from, um, but I think it goes without saying that it would be unconscionable to take that from existing HIV dollars um, and try and shift that um, into this response. It, it would need to come from somewhere else. Thank you. Absolutely, that was gonna be my point, Tyler. So thank you for that, which is often what happens. And as it happened with COVID, dollars were taken from HIV prevention or the HIV work for COVID. I mean, I think just, um, of like some of the things that we're seeing here in DC, which is um, a region of three different jurisdictions, is that consistent messaging. And Dr. Dimitri, I know you have kind of alluded to it to where jurisdictions are able to kind of dictate how they would have their strategies. But what we've seen is that the difficulties in the messaging when we have, and it's not an octenny of the health departments and how we have say, for example, DC health department, who is now has shifted their strategy to get as many people um, uh, with the first dose. But then we have some jurisdictions in Maryland who are using it as this post exposure, right? And so now our community members are like, wait a minute, so I can only get it after I present with monkeypox, right? Which is in some minds kind of a treatment versus a vaccine, right? And the, the different messaging, as you just said, in terms of to lessen kind of the um, effect of the um, infection. And so that is confusing. And then I think from a fiscal responsibility or, or stewardship side, and albeit that us helping us is not a directly funded CBO um, anymore. So I wanted to put that in maybe in the next round. Um, but just wanted to also say, especially when we're looking at not only the federal dollars, but the state dollars and being able to really allocate staffing for these efforts, right? And how and being nimble in that, because we have been told that if there's some of our staff who are 100% health department dollars, that they cannot be part of these responses, right? Unless it's, for example, one of our case managers and they're talking about it in the sense of like individual counseling and uh, testing and treatment for somebody living with HIV, right? So, so also having that messaging um, within this robust system um, as we are um, navigating that. Cause now to ensure that we are um, not, not doing what we're supposed to be doing with governmental dollars, but uh, having that guidance, I think that's the other piece. And then just the last is really this piece around stigma. Um, I know at least five people already who have um, shown or has FaceTimed me and have asked, and I'm, not, I'm PhD, not MD, but I do go to the CDC's website and say that does look like a pox. And if I think about it, when I've had chicken pox and they will just self-isolate for 21 days, will not go anywhere because they do not want that shame, that stigma of monkey pox, right? And so I think it's um, going, that may also lead to under-reporting um, um, and uh, uh, folks just self self trying to diagnose and uh, uh, get through this. Cause again, I want, so just taking that from COVID and just like, well, I just won't present anywhere. So I think, so that it can, if there's anything else around it being less stigmatizing. Thank you for that, DeMarcus. Uh, kind of leads me, I'm gonna try to craft a, a question that's amalgamation of a trend that we've been seeing in some of the Q and A. Um, 
So concerns have been raised in the United States that the U.S. isn't adequately prepared to address monkeypox clusters that form among children and adolescents. As we're moving towards the school year, how uh, should we be? How much should we be worried about monkeypox monkeypox clusters forming in schools and universities? And what is the federal government doing to prevent this transmission from occurring? And I kind of want to also add based on DeMarc's comment around LGBTQ stigma, um, there's major concern floating across communities about anti-LGBTQ sentiments, since we're hearing this being mostly among MSM. What is what is your response, uh, Dimitri? So I'll, I'm, I'm going to send the school's question to Alexa as a start, just to see, like, so, because so, I know there's, there's good conversations going on. I'm happy to help out there too, but I'll have her start with that. And I'll talk a little bit about the stigma, which is, you know, it's really public health responsibility. And by public health, I mean local, local, federal, state, et cetera, to really be the leaders in the way that the language is crafted around what we're doing with any infection or any condition that uh, uh, that it, that impacts uh, a group that is at its core already stig stigmatized or marginalized. So we've been very intentional um, to make sure that like the way that we're approaching this is really to create a multi-layer strategy uh, that we don't propagate stigma by messaging and propagate against stigma by our interventions. So really the, the idea of like really creating general messages that are really focused on like the science and transmissibility, trying very hard to create harm reduction messaging that doesn't vilify gay sex or people or sex between men. Um, and then also making sure that we then do exactly this, which is to stimulate interest by trusted messengers to make sure that you all are armed with like language that you can then use and translate, whether that is from the linguistic perspective or like other perspective culturally, to make sure that you're able to communicate with the folks that you actually reach that we will never reach. So, I mean, I think that this is all part of the strategy, the sort of listening and information and getting things from you and making sure that we, you know about our resources, but also like, I'll tell you the intentionality with which this response has said, like from the very first day, it's how are we gonna do this without us making the stigma worse and being a leader in showing how we're not making the st stigma worse, as opposed to like, I hope we don't make the stigma worse. It was intentional. And so, um, you know, this kind of conversation and feedback is so important so we can continue the intentionality because at the end of the day, this outbreak is going to evolve. And what was right two months ago is not going to be right a month from now and won't be right five months from now. So it's it's not just a, we've shaken, baked it and we're done. It's that we need to always evaluate and reevaluate how we can message correctly good public health science-based advice without generating stigma. And it's like, I've got to say, as like taking off my my official hat, like as a as myself, as, as a gay man, I'm like, this is how it should have been in 1981. And so I think that we're, things are really, it's kind of impressive. So um, please keep engaging with us um, and come to these sessions, even though I know that they sort of sap your time, but promise that we're going to, that we are going to take this stuff back. Alexa, I'm not sure if you want to comment about uh, about schools. I'm happy to sort of back you up or, or say more um, after you start. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the comment about schools. We've definitely been hearing a lot of questions about schools and children and people who are looking for resources on that. I will just say that it is a high priority for us. We know, for example, in the school district I'm in, school started today. So we know that it's a particularly time sensitive issue. Um, we have materials in the pipeline and we're hoping that we'll have something to share. And I'll just also say that you know, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, very similar to this intentional efforts to get once the sort of once we have production. I mean, we, we do actually have things already like we have guidance around congregate settings, which actually ends up being very similar to sort of like uh, to lots of the other guidance. So I think that um, important lessons from COVID is that we don't necessarily need to have different guidelines and guidance for different environments because that tends to be confusing. But the same idea of making sure that we get it to the right people through engagement is going to be, I think, a critical step for us to make sure that that folks who, who are in the know are in the know. Thanks, Alexa. Thank you. Um, another question we have, uh, what do people living with HIV need to know um, to, infect, to effectively protect themselves and their communities? So I'm going to hand it to Alexa first so she can talk about the very many CDC resources that have been created to assist with this. And then uh, we can talk about the clinical problem. Well, yeah, I, I'll just say briefly that I think a lot of those resources that were on the slide that Dimitri shared are very relevant for people living with HIV. Um, we are working on a lot of materials for people who are trying to understand 
what are what's the risk presented by various act activities or behaviors and how can they make the best decisions for them. Um, we also are, are have developed materials for providers um, around clinical considerations for people with HIV, what's the same and what might be different when you're considering whether someone with HIV might have monkeypox or whether they do have monkeypox and, and issues around treatment or vaccination. Um, Dimitri, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I actually think you don't need me. Uh, I think you covered it. So really, I think I'll say what's important is like in some series of people, people who are uh, people who are diagnosed with monkeypox, it's a high proportion of individuals who are co-infected with HIV. Sometimes, at least I think the New England Journal article, if I remember, was about 40%. So um, the good news so far is that there doesn't seem to be a tendency toward worse outcome. Um, although anecdotally, there are some of the, some potentially like more hospitalizations in some areas of the world related to HIV. But when you talk to them, it's not about severity per se, but about, uh, about concern about the potential for severity. With that said, it's important that, that um, especially providers that care for people living with HIV and that's social service as well as medical, that they really help us get the word out about like the harm reduction strategies and how to like protect yourself and stay safe while also making sure that um, we uh, make sure that folks living with HIV and providers know how to connect to where vaccine is available when it pops up in their jurisdiction. Thanks. Great. Are there any other measures beyond what's currently used to sanitize clinical spaces that HIV service organization staff should be adopting when providing care for people who may have uh, may have monkeypox to reduce the chances of transmission? So I, I think that the, our sort of um, it depends on sort of what the interaction is, right? So without close physical contact. Um, you know, which sometimes does happen in a clinical setting with exams, like that's a bit different. So I think it's it's always worth looking at a couple of our documents. I think one of them is is sort of in clinical settings, we have infection control guidance, and we also have some infection control guidance for the home, which in some ways could be uh, can be uh, can be extrapolated to some of the more social service environments, depending on the scenario. So I would say, like, keep a look look at those; they're really good. Um, the clinical the clinical one is if you have clinical spaces, it's very specific. And the home one talks about things like, you know, like shared materials and all that. And it's worth taking a look at. Alexa, anything to add from your perspective? No is an okay answer. Nope. nope. <laughs> the resources I was going to mention. Great. Imagine that. <laughs> Great response. Thank you. Kelvin P. You ask, what is being done to ensure vaccine equity to areas outside of big cities like New York or San Francisco? So I can start. Um, I think uh, one of I think that there's an uh, 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 I think one of the statements I want to say was it Demarc who said it or was it Tyler? I can't remember because they were so they both had such great things to say. But the sort of idea that when you have a scarcity model, some of the equity issues become more complex. I think that was Tyler or was it Demarc? We'll just say one of them had a really great comment about it. So, so, so I think that that is like one of the realities, but I think we're also at CDC trying to give really clear guidance to jurisdictions about how they can enhance equity, even if it's in that first come first serve strategy. And I think we've seen some good models that we're magnifying. So I think you've heard about some from others, but then also like giving legs up to organizations that serve people, like awareness of vaccine, like when that happens, et cetera. And then ultimately, I think um, just, um, you know, if, if and I, I'll give an example, like I was uh, actually uh, was participated as a vaccinator um, in a couple of local events in Atlanta. And like, I, I remember seeing the first round where, you know, there was, you know, uh, there was the hustle to start to get the vaccine appointments up. And then um, when that happened, it was not a very diverse group that came. And then on the second round, um, there, there, because of the observation that there wasn't a very diverse group that came, there was actually intentional action taken based on what local environments are like to be able to increase equity. And that group of people was completely different. So I think it just makes the point that like it's a hyper local answer equity, but we're giving guidance to make sure that folks prioritize it and that it needs to be intentional at the beginning as opposed to an afterthought. Um, so that's so there's and I think as vaccine availability increases and our diversity of venue potentially could increase. I think we know from COVID some of the tools that we can use to increase equity in vaccine, he says, after seven months of being the vaccine deputy instead of manager. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll just add that we also are encouraging things like mobile and pop-up events, as well as just fundamentally community engagement and developing response plans around monkeypox, including around vaccine um, distribution. Yeah, and I would just add as um, a local pro um, provider um, is to also work like as an executive director to executive direct, right? Like I made it in, um, in intentional efforts to reach out to our local and state health departments because they're the ones that are responding locally. And so with that, um, been, been very intentional, being on calls, um, updating information, sending kind of summaries of what clients are saying for them to respond. And, and, and so we have to encourage and support um, our local health departments and also advise on how to effectively respond, right? And so um, I just think that there's a place and space for um, local agencies that are outside of the big cities, because although we're here in DC, we're neighbored um, by a suburban, highly rural county that you wouldn't think, but it is. And so, which also um, increase, uh, which, which has a number of uh, challenges such as access and transportation, et cetera. So I think that there's a lot that we can do on all levels um, as I'm also seeing stuff in the chat. So I would encourage all of those um, who are non-FQHC or even FQHC smaller organizations to also have a groundswell locally um, on, on how to respond. Thank you. I'm going to ask one final question, um, and then I'd like to give the panelists the opportunity to share any final closing remarks in the interest of time. Um, but I'm wondering, um, to our folks at the CDC, uh, do people who use drugs have any uh, additional vulnerable vulnerability to monkeypox? And if so, um, uh, what, what advice do you have for people who use drugs? So I think, I think that it's an inherent vulnerability given close skin to skin contact that can happen, um, both in the context of drug use and often some other sort of environments where, where close skin to skin contact can happen, which is why it's so important to have vigilance and general messaging for populations, not just focused on gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, footnote, gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, some of them also use drugs. So I think, um, I think that it's, um, it's really important to have that clear guidance. And I'm not sure, Alexa, if there's any is anything that you can add from like the from the epi perspective on what, what we're seeing? No, I think it's an area where we don't have a lot of data at CDC. I think there are some state and local health departments that have data, but I don't have a lot to add from that perspective. Great. So again, I I at the beginning of this outbreak, one of the things that I mentioned was that um this one reminds me a lot of community acquired or community uh community associated methicillin and resistant staph aureus. So MRSA, remember MRSA 2008, where we started seeing first in gay bisexual other men who have sex with men, and it was really stuck in that community for a while. And then all of a sudden it popped into homeless shelters, it popped into athletes, it popped into other congregate settings. So we have to have vigilance for that. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm not saying it's going to travel in the same way, but it's another disease that's transmitted by close physical contact. So other cultures, other environments, other groups have close physical contact. And again, it's just a piece of DNA wrapped in some fat. It's not smart enough to know um, if it's uh, if someone is transgender, cisgender, or gay, bisexual, it's that close contact that does it. So we need to have vigilance and clear messaging to make sure that we uh, that we uh, we um, identify cases as they come up and also make sure that we give good prevention messages. Thank you. Um, I just want to flag before hearing final remarks. Um, we've gotten an overwhelming amount of questions. It's really wonderful. We're going to make sure that we collect all of these questions and we will like direct them literally to the, the best. Okay. <laughs> literally just, the absolutely. best. Absolutely. Um, so we will be sharing out slides and information, but turn it over to folks for final remarks. CDC are our community partners. Um, I just wanted to thank you both for being here. Um, I am happy to see that you'll be in this new capacity, Dimitri, um, someone who has such a long history in this work and commitment to the work. Um, I don't think that we need to remind um, you or anyone on this call that this period of time, while not fatal, like the HIV epidemic is causing just an extreme amount of anxiety and distress and fear and literal pain within our community that's going to have lasting consequences. 
And um, it is a difficult space to be in that it has been so many weeks um, and we're just now seeing what feels like urgency after demanding um, urgency around the issue for a while from the federal government. Folks are tired and exhausted from the last few years of work already in the organizations that we work for um, on the ground in the community. And um, this is just another long going issue that is going to continue to impact our day to day lives until we can get control of it. So anything we can do to get more resources, more communication, um, better coordination will only um, help us all in the long run. Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, very well said, so I won't say too much more um, to add on to Tyler, but do want to say thank you, Carl, and to Age United for having me and giving me this opportunity to share this space with Demetri and Tyler, and also Alexa. Hey, Alexa, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> um, and also uh, want to uh, congratulate you too, Demetri, on um, your new appointment and that uh, we have um uh advocate and friend in this space that is knowledgeable and will help lead the, this effort from the um federal level and just know that you have the support of local communities and local organizations to work with our local health departments to get that done because so that we can definitely learn from covid and age of and others as as we have said so that we don't have that same um um uh situation. And so I do just want to highlight again um, around um, supporting and allowing local organizations to be part of and lead some of these particular efforts, which is not always done. Um, I know that um, many times on federal level, uh, the thought is to just give to state and local health departments, um, but those models are not always best in certain um, locales, especially having spent quite a bit of time in deep southern states. And so I think as we look at um, these um, plans and as we look as resources become available, how we can best synergize to get these um, things done, because we still, regardless how we see it, we'll have miscommunication, uh, 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 misinterpretation of things, continued medical mistrust, vaccine hesitancy, et cetera. And so we, as community-based organizations who work day in and day out very closely with community and our and community indigenous to communities, um, we, I think, are well positioned to be able to um, get the groundswell in the efforts that um, the federal government and others want to see. Thank you, DeMarc. I just want to say a big thank you to Dimitri and Alexa for making yourselves available um, and acknowledge it really is comforting to have you um, at the helm of this response. Um, you know, it has to be acknowledged that for long term survivors of HIV, this is a very triggering moment. Um, and having someone that's been a part of community and that is so responsive to community is a really big deal. So thank you. Uh, we promised we'd get you off on time. Uh, but um, we want to get you back to the U.S. as quickly as possible to continue the monkeypox response. Um, but we're uh, we're looking forward to future listening sessions and opportunities to engage with CDC and community directly. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks, everyone. What a great session. Just had to say that out loud. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you. So helpful. So important. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Off I go to Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Safe travels. Thanks. Bye-bye.